enclosure, Iron Age enclosure, and lots of other little things around there. Stop showing off. <laughs> it's so, okay. I got family from the area. Oh, okay. Now stop. Now I've actually got my um, I've got my folklore and folk stories of Wales book, Mary Trevilian, and there's hopefully going to be um, two little snippets from here that you may not have come across. There's a snippet in connection with an owl. Uh, and I found something in connection with a with somebody who was aged seven thousand seven hundred seventy seven that was buried at Langanoid. Did you know those two? Probably no. Probably not on those. So um, so that that's going to be that's where we're going to go. So that's the Mary Trevilian bit. And I just thought tonight it would be interesting to um, dabble with a little bit. Um, in regards to the maid of Kevin Idver. So we're going to redo the maid of Kevin Idver, but from another angle. It's always good to do these stories from other angles. So I need, away from the building that we've got behind me, which is um, associated with the uh, maid of Kev Kevin Idver, naturally, um, I'm just going to get my screen on it. And anyone who's got, who's sort of sending notes through and um, wanting to, to sort of ask me things um, to avoid me getting distracted. I'm going to read them at the end. So, right, Del. Now I am here. I'm pouring tea. Oh well, that's that, that's really effective. You know, just as I'm talking, just as I'm getting into it, right. So this is the um, the corner house at Langanai, which some people have been familiar with, and we've got the wonderful Fats building, which we look at the end, which dates from. The 1140s, believe it or not, even further than that. So we got this nice little image. And if we go back again to the image that was in my background, I think this would be a really nice place to start. So last time I, I read out one of the stories in connection with um, Kevin Idver in regards to the work of Mary Trevilian. And I, I picked up something else that I was a little bit ready to read out. So this is, this is where we're going to go first. So now this is, this is a nice sort of shortened version uh, in connection with the maid of Kevin Idver. And it's actually, it's, it's so concise um, that it, it sort of is a good introduction. So the maid of Kevin Idver, if any of you can remember, Anne Thomas, the maid. Now, I've been to the location of the house or the lodge, Kevin Idver, and every, obviously what you see there is a lot later in date. And so the original story dates back into the 1700s. And she was a young heiress. And being a young heiress, she's going to have loads of interest. And she lived with her parents at Kevin Idver Lodge. As we say, in the 1700s, first time I've heard this story was not actually when we went to Kevin Idver, was actually by a gentleman at Coity Castle, of all places. Anyway, this was years ago. So Anne, love story goes, fell in love with a poor Thatcher, known as Will Hopkin. And Will Hopkin, as some of you are also aware of, um, was a local poet as well. And he, there's a piece of poetry that um, I'm thinking I might leave to... You're a, breaking up, Carl. Am I? Yeah. I, why is this happening on Saturdays? What, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to keep flowing, right? And if anyone's not catching anything, then this is recorded anyway, and you can catch up on the okay. recording. So I'm just going to keep going. So if I am breaking up, then you know what the situation is. Anyway, the story goes that a mother found out and promptly banned Anne from using writing paper and ink. And with the story that... Anne wanted to continue uh, the conversations, wanted to continue the writing um, back and forth with Will Hopkin. And story has it again, is that she sent out her servant with messages um, written on all sorts of bits and pieces. And they say that she actually wrote on leaves, but I'm not really sure she did. But anyway, she was so keen to keep in contact with Will that she actually wrote um, in her own blood on anything she um, could and they went out naturally to uh, to will um, time went by and with this is a very much of a shortened version time went by and will moved away to bristol docks 
eventually um, Anne married a, another gentleman. So she was forced to marry somebody else. The parents did not approve of her relationship with Will at all. You know, a lowly Thatcher's um, son and a lowly Thatcher, you know, can't really marry into somebody like that. So she married somebody by the name of Anthony Maddox. Um, and she, the marriage only lasted two years. She died of a broken heart and that was it. And it couldn't have been a very great marriage because um, Anthony Maddox married again a few years later um, to, a, to another young heiress. So we were just into marrying all these different heiresses. Anyway, Will, Will Hopkin um, never married the, the, the love of her life. Um, and died 14 years later. And we do have a date there, 1741. So we've actually got dates. He died at the age of 40. He and Anne, and, and the, the great thing about this, when we actually look at the church, and hopefully this is sounding a little bit more clearer. How's it going, Del? That's fine. Good. Um, the, what, the thing is about this story, which we missed out last time, when we did the cave in, uh, made of Kevin Idver, it was just like my stag made a Kevin Idver and that's what we did, but it didn't really put things into context. The one thing about this is we're gonna actually look at the church and the churchyard and a few things about the ch church, which I didn't really know about. And, and I've got another piece that I'm thinking none of you have actually read at all um, about the holy pilgrimage route with a few um, bits that lead me directly into the story because it links in with Penn Reese which is um, half a mile away from where I actually live in the Rhondda Valley. So there's a nice little link there. Anyway, he, Will Hopkin and Anne, amazingly enough, are both buried at Langanoy Church. So even though in life they weren't sort of together, they're sort of buried within the same church graveyard at Langanoy Church. So that's great. So they're both united in 1741. Anne is buried um, slightly away from him, but again in the church graveyard. Anne is buried in the family grave in the chancel. So obviously, rather rich family, they had to be buried in the family grave in the chancel. While Will lies in the church graveyard under the shade of a yew tree. Now you can't get any more poetic than being buried under a yew tree. Absolutely amazing. The original gravestone um, gravestones have been replaced and taken to the bell tower of the church because it is part of this great love story, Langanoid, made of Kevin Idver. But it, it, it's not just, Langanoid is not just about, um, is not just about the maid, it's about a very great history as Dell introduced the, the Iron Age landscape, uh, the much older landscape as well, and the medieval landscape and these stories and, 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 and we will go on to the castle. Um, being a well-known poet, um, just quickly in, in saying, um, there's a poem known as the, hang on, I've got an internet connection problem a second, hang on. Um, a, a, a poetry song, song, love song known as the Begiliar Gwenith, uh, which is probably the wrong pronunciation. It's sort of- Begiliar Gwenith Gwen. Thank you very much. Do you know, I should have just let you do this. <laughs> <laughs> That's a better pronunciation than me. Um, up until today, I thought I'm going to struggle pronouncing this, even though I'm a partial Welsh speaker myself. <laughs> it was quite pathetic, really. Anyway, so what I want to do is, is move directly onto that and something that's more familiar to me, Langanoid Castle. When I say familiar to me, I'm more familiar with the archaeology and the medieval stuff. So that's where we're going to go next. So I want to just actually change the screen and the images a second. So if you just let me do that. Um, and we'll just um, move on a little bit more, and here we go. So obviously, obviously, we got the we're going to be looking at the um, corner in the corner pub in in a short while. Corner house, various different names for it, um, and naturally, it's classed as being one of the oldest pubs in the whole of Cymru. There it is again, and to give you an idea where we are, um, for those that don't know where we are. Um, Land again in this area, looking at the map, and then we go to there it is. So we've got the road actually leading to my stag, Clan and sort of over to here. Interestingly enough, the site known as Castle Farm that's where the story 
of the castle is going to come in there and that's where we're going to go next but sort of an overview um very very rich um very rich landscape so get my sort of little drawing stuff in there um as we go right del knows i like my drawing so you've got langanoid uh, you've got margam um you've got the road to my steg and over in this direction you've got the ron the valley which directly leads us into um i'm told one of the greatest shrines in um christendom um the the lady of penrice but we're not really going to do that tonight but we will mention it but langanoid is meant to be the heart of a great pilgrimage route uh, throughout the landscape um, of, of Glamorgan. And with that being said, it's also um, a landscape that does have a castle. It's also a landscape that does go bump in the night. So let's actually go on to it. So there we go. So we've got, we've got a few images associated with the remains of Llanganoid Castle and it would be nice to sort of flit into these images it's not one of those great massively built castles that we associate with say Caerphilly but apparently the gateway at Llangunoedd from my reading and research actually tells me that it was very much in the same style as the main gateway at Caerphilly so that means that this is a rather important point um, a rather important site as well and there's only little bits of the actual dress masonry um, that you can actually see at the site. Um, and you have obviously got to get permission, but a little bit of um, dress masonry, which, which has come onto the site, like lots of local castles, um, it's, it's constructed out of the local sandstone, which, which is naturally quarryable from the area. Um, lots, of, lots of bits of trees and stuff, lots of humps and bumps in an open field, which we're going to actually look at. Um, and then I'd like to sort of draw us into some of the uh, information that I've managed to research on the castle. Um, and it would be interesting to ask people at the end, and I'm going to take a note of this, um, how many people actually knew that there was a castle at Langanoid? And I, I would be within that category as well. And Dal, you've obviously been to the site of the castle, yeah? Yes. Once, many times? Uh, twice, but driven past the site frequently. You wouldn't know it's there unless you can see the sign by the farm. <laughs> um, Castle Farm, exactly. Is, yeah. this, is this image familiar or the more dressed up image? No, that one's familiar. It's, it's quite overgrown. Yeah, it is. It's definitely overgrown. Mm. Look at all that. But, but obviously it's, it's very much on the fact that, that any archaeological work there hasn't interfered with this um, locality um, and there you go looking down on it um, <clears throat> so obviously that's going to be very familiar to you Del yeah yeah good so what, we're, what I'm going to do now I'm going to go to my notes um, and we're going to see what I can actually what I've actually researched which which will be very very useful so I've I didn't, I didn't really come up with a massive amount on Langanoid Castle, um, but the castle itself is, is not unusual in the fact that it's one of those castles that very few people actually know about. Um, in medieval times, it could be said to be um, a prominent outpost of the new Norman lordships, which were being established across the region as they were carving into the native princely lordships that had existed before the 1100s and it's it's believed somewhere along the lines of the, the date springs to mind again 1147 when you again look at the oldest building um, in Langunoid being in exactly the same date but 1147 and it's it's first mentioned in documents from about 1246 and over and over again the history the history maps this as an important locality. And Dal, do you know what I'm thinking I'm going to do? You know when we're doing the, the, the Welsh archaeology and history on a, a Wednesday evening? Yeah. This site would be a really interesting site to actually re revisit. And the reason why it'd be it an interesting be. site to revisit is that what the, the following lines, the castle was plundered in 1258, being rebuilt 
probably replundered um, in the late um, 1270s by um, Llewellyn um, at, at Griffith. Then it's burnt down again in about 1291, 1292, being rebuilt in 1294. Then again, again, it's, it's burnt down in the 1300s. So it's continually being destroyed and burnt down. And, and the Royal Commission on Ancient Historic Monuments say that it's, 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 it's a prominent site that can be seen to overlook the landscape. And this thing about the, the Twin Towered Gatehouse over, overlooking um, a court-like area, very similar to the gatehouse at Cavilli Castle. Um, and it's believed that the, this sort of later stage of stonework at Langanoyth dates from the similar period that actually the work of Cavilli is actually taking place. So the builders at Cavilli may actually be the same builders rebuilding this site, which is, which is a really nice link. Um, and Dell so rightly said, you know, the site is overgrown, it's, it's really degraded, um, and, you know, you can't see anything much of the curtain wall. You're looking at the image there, you can sort of see an outline, but that's very much all you can see. However, um, there's a little bit more to actually be said about this, and this is where we're going to go. Now, one... One little, one little site that I, that I like actually um, visiting is the site, the site um, put together um, about various castles in Wales. And I usually like visiting this one. And it's, it's, sort, of, um, it's sort of describing that there would have been a lot, that, you know, there was once on display a large number of homes at the site. And lots of those dress stones are no longer visible, which is a great, great shame. And the quote again, it's much injured in wars, in the wars themselves. And up until, up until the, um, up until about the 12, 1260s, 1270s, it was a border territory. There was border territory between Normans and those damnable uh, natives on the other side. So it's much injured by war. That quote is much injured by war. And it stormed again in 1306, which is a rather interesting date. Um, and that's rather interesting for me when we do the Welsh archaeology and history. That you don't just see one or two dates in history where you have rebellions like Owen Glyndwr um, and Llewellyn at Griffith, you, and Llewellyn Bren and, and, um, and so on and so on. There, there, there are other moments in history where the people of this land have had enough and we're constantly, constantly rebelling. That's a really, really important point when we actually paint the history of this castle and many other castles in the area. The question should be asked, um, and you know where I'm going to go next, Del, is this a site that may have originally been a native build castle? Um, and you know what? We're not going to explore that today. A little bit more information about that in the future. So what I'd like to do now, I'd like to... I'd like to look a little bit um, at the church, and I'm very reminded that I don't wanna, I don't wanna rush what we've got tonight, but before we actually go to the church, let's sort of have, a, have another little bit of a teaser of those images. So um, if, we, if we're sort of um, looking, um, we can, um, hang on, get, get my little, oh, hang on, not that there, I don't want that. Um, so what we're seeing here, we're seeing all these, these ditches around the outside. This would have been a formidable curtain wall, probably about 10 meters in height at one stage. You've got a rather large ditch here, evidence of the ditches. Um, and interesting enough, you've got this other defensive wall around the outside as well. So it, you've, got, you've got two sets of defenses, two sets of defensive walls which would be unusual in a context of it originally being a native build castle, but not unusual in the context of Norman build castles, where if you want to compare this with something like Caerphilly, Caerphilly has a number of concentric walls, towers and castles. That's put into the context. It's probably likely that by looking at the landscape, lots of the walls of the farm buildings and so on and so on, lots of the rebuild at Langanoid has probably meant that these walls have been ex extensively looted. 
losing the archaeological remains that we would usually associate with this site. But if this site was excavated, we might be able to see a little bit more. So moving on to my next slide. Oh, look at that nice little bit of a stone. Nice carved stone there. Now, I need a little bit of information to um, say whether the following thing I'm going to say is right or wrong. But I'm assuming um, that this stone is probably Sutton sandstone and this stone being very well dressed stone is actually from those Sutton sandstone quarries that we mentioned only last week. So you've got a nice lot of, little bit of chevron stone there, really nice. And then what would have happened is this other stone here, this, um, this sandstone um, would have been the native quarried stone. So all those little pits and ditches and so on, which you can see around the landscape that you've already seen on that aerial view, that's where lots of the stone is coming from. If any of you are interested in geology, um, the stone, the, the local sandstone, in most of South Wales is very much under the surface. You don't have to go deep to actually find the stone. And, and this is why um, across the whole of South Wales, you know, particularly the valleys, is pockmarked with is pockmarked with holes everywhere. And that's where the quarry material is coming from, from the medieval period all the way through up until the time of the great mining explosion um, after the 1750s. And then it's the, those very pot spots of those quarries that um, they might actually go a little bit deeper. And that's where you're getting um, the great mining activity coming from when you're looking at the very um, much later um, um, coal mining. As some of you will be aware that uh, the landscape is dominated by, um, by iron mining further up. Uh, in the valleys before we're talking about coal. Of, of course, a few more humps and bumps. Um, John might get on his um, high horse afterwards and say, let's get in there, let's rip all the trees down, let's get at the archaeology. But in lots of ways, it's the tree roots keeping the archaeology intact. And it's a great shame I don't have much more in the sense of archaeological work that's actually been undertaken there. But you know what, Dell, we're going to go on to the church graveyard. Um, I've been to that church graveyard, but I've never been all the way to the back. Have you, Del? No, we tend to just go to one of the pubs for lunch or um, just drive through. It's on the way to some property one of my uncles has got. And interesting enough, you can you can you can very much you can very much fall into the pub and you can go into the church and you can do likewise. Rather interesting, mm. rather interesting way of doing that. Um, so it'd be quite con convenient for a burial, wouldn't it? So, sort of, you know, we, got, we, can, we can go to the church and then we can go to the wake. Um, it's like, like the full circle thing. Sorry, that sounds a bit morbid. Um, so it, it would be nice if I, if I really got into the church and got, got into the nuts and bolts of it. And some of you are wondering, where are the ghosts and um, other things tonight? They do come up towards the end um, in regards to the pub. And we've got one little mention of my steg just to keep those Mystegians happy. Um, so again, the church is a really impressive church and we've got a number of nice um, yew trees associated with it. And it's, it's a bit of a large, large yard actually. But it's obviously, um, it's obviously um, moved in time. Now, is this, is this image familiar um, inside the church or is this unfamiliar to you, Del? It's familiar. And what is interesting to me, really interesting, is something that I picked up today. And you might know this, but then again, you might not. So I've gone through to, I've, I've done my little bit of research on, um, th with the Royal Commission on Ancient, um, Ancient Historical Monuments today. And I just thought, I, I wanted to sort of get a nice little bit of information. So the church itself is in the heart of the village. And there's a few more maps coming up for those that are getting a little bit disorientated. But, um, one, what I, I, I liked reading this, right? In the res restoration inside the church, damnable Victorians always, in 1892, um, they came across some paintings. But it looks like those paintings were hacked out um, and discarded into the church graveyard in 1892. And that makes my blood boil because I've been... Uh, researching with my researcher in Barry Richard for Archaeology Cymru and we've been researching another church in the Vale of Morgan St Peter's Church and that church 
they described that there was actually paintings in there as well. And they may have, some of them may have been lost in the Victorian period as well, which is a, which is a huge shame. So we've got, we've got medieval paintings inside the church. Is there a record of them? It has somebody actually an, made a note of these? Um, and the answer is, I am really not sure. Um, there was also found, and this leads us into the end of the lecture, um, they, they found what they, they believed was a, a, was a piece of timber which was painted, which was, um, which was regarded as part of one of the greatest rood screens. A rood screen is basically, um, um, as you, you, you look from the nave in the church where you are now and you look in there and you've got the chancel, there would have been a rood screen in front of that, yeah? And there would have been um, access via a stairwell from the ch from the chancel which is which are usually inevitably always blocked up some are left open and then you would have gone onto a gallery on the top and then i've got an image of a rood screen coming up um and you would have had this beautiful rood screen and 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 there would have been a little wooden gate so the the common people like you and dell wouldn't have gone into the chancel but the rood screen itself usually with representations of of, of the holy trinity or uh, peter or paul um or anything like that and it'd been beautifully painted and amazingly enough um after everyone had thought it'd been completely destroyed the, it says painted room screen fragment of the painted room screen found in a put log hole during the restoration now that's interesting so put logs as we all know are scaffolding um are, are, are the holes that which were used to help basically as, as your stone wall uh beam through the wall um scaffolding planks next course beams scaffolding planks and then afterwards they'd be cut off they'd be um there'd be a plug of uh mortar and render put in them but it looks like on this one this was actually one of the original um holding um putt logs um a beam beam log more than anything for actually the root screen so we'll actually go on to that it's rather interesting did you know that Dell? no so you've learned something tonight. Good, um, which, which is brilliant. I was going to get. I was feeling a bit embarrassed that you said you knew everything. Um, so I, I really like that when you actually get those little snippets and you actually find them. And you think I, I was dead impressed with that one. Um, and well, we'll get, I want to want to do a little bit of information about the church now. And and I, I really wanted to um, keep what I had um, in regards to um where we're going to go um a, a little bit more um a little bit more sort of basic and fixed so so here we go um i just want to just get on to this a minute um hang on a minute hang on a minute my notes are all in a bit of disarray a minute okay here we go that's right got it um now what i wanted to i wanted to say this that um langunai church the church of saint Canoith, and if anyone knows, Dell, you'll know this land being the place or the parish, um, Gunoith, Canoith, St. Canoith, Parish Church of Land Well, you, you know that. Um, yeah. And many places in, in Wales are associated with the word, you know, you use the word land in the title, um, Land Gamach, um, Land Carven, all these sort of lands, the place of the parish of the church, and, and the saint's name would usually fo follow. And it's said that St. Canoith, a local saint, now he's a local boy, Dell, for once. Um, you, know, I, you know what I'm like, I get very critical about Caddock and Ilkdid and all these other ones, but Canoith, I like that one um, because he's, he's a, he sounds local, he sounds real, and it dates, it dates possibly the founding of that church to maybe the 500s. Maybe he's a he's come into the Roman tradition, which is rather than from Europe, you know, lots of these saints come over from Europe, they say they're from this area and they're not. So St. Canoy, there's a, a nice local one. Um, and in my little notes here, it says little remains of the original structure, but the original structure would have been um, local stone, rude, rude stone, stone, it says that word rude stone, rude stone, local stone. And, and then you would have had um, timber frame and then you would have had the wattle panels, daubed over that had been sort of 
Um, a church maybe from about the nine, ten hundreds. If there was a church there before, it would have been of a small affair and maybe not a church at all. Because one thing that people actually miss when they're actually doing lectures like this, they always say there was always an early church, right? And they go on to saying it was a little wooden church and there was a stone church, as I've just said, the stone church um, and then the wattle and timber. But one thing that everyone always misses is the early stage, because initially there were never any native there were never any churches in Cymru basically what you'd have had um, you'd have had a socket you'd have had a stone socket in the yard and a, a, a local holy man would have visited parish to parish um, and they would have preached the uh, got the gospel they would have preached the word of God um, they, they, they would have gathered the people together that's what that's what church basically means a class a class an area it's it's a, a a place where people meet rather than a church itself and i wanted to put that across and this socket this stone this stone socket with a hole in it um is is the original church that that's all it was there was no roof on it you don't need a roof in my house there are any mansions some of you have come across that and that itself and and at at the original stone it's believed a really old stone is now in the porch at the church and there's a hole in it right and that hole is really important and Dell, you know i sh i took you to mirtha mauer church and we did that ghost walk and i showed you that big sort of um glacial erratic stone with a hole in it remember that yeah and I said, yeah. what would happen is a clergyman would go around village to village with a, with a piece of wood before any wooden church or any stone church was erected. I always say that. Interesting enough, I always say that, but very few writers of any works ever, um, ever write this down. And interesting enough, in this source I've got in front of me is somebody who says, before the stone and wattle timber and mud church, um, a stone socket for a wooden cross which the founder set up um, before the church was built. Now we, we got that here, black and white, and it's so good that I've actually got um, somebody else agreeing with me there. And going back to the church as well, um, what's happening with these churches throughout, throughout Wales, not in, well, I can exclude sort of mid Wales and a bit of West Wales, the Victorians are coming, are coming around and they're ripping all the wonderful stone out all the medieval stuff they're ripping it all out in the medieval in, in the victorian period because they they believe what we're going to do we're going to refresh these churches so they're ripping all the old stone stuff out uh, and it's really unfortunate um and what they did they 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 grabbed this um stone socket from the yard and they chucked it into the into the wall um and it was used for repairs back in the day, but it's, it's, it's been slightly put more in prominence today in the church. Um, and unfortunately, the, the end result is back to what I said. When we get to the 1890s, Victorians, uh, of at least throughout South Wales, hacked all the render from the inside of the churches and all the painting. So you've got uh, bare walls inside, bare walls outside, and it makes these churches very damp. And the next thing that people do, knowing that the churches get very damp, they start ripping out the inside of the churches, putting central heatings in, eating systems in, damaging the church even further, um, making them vulnerable to subsidence. And it's the Victorians that really destroyed our churches. Don't really need to blame the Puritans and Henry VIII all the time. Anyway, moving on. So obviously being it rebuilt and all the rest of it and so on. And the church that you can actually see, that lots of the stone that you can actually see, the stone footing today, other than the windows, dates probably from about the 1200s. Um, and it's talking, about, it's talking about this wonderful thing. Um, in the 1400s, a square tower is added. Um, I usually say that that's usually happening. Square towers are usually added through, um, throughout churches, um, throughout um, the area. And it's talking about um, oaken pews going into the church in the 1400s. Wonderful oaken pews. And Dell, you know, the sad thing is, Lots of these oaken pews in churches throughout um, South Wales were still there in 1850. And guess what happened? We got reports of most of them being ripped out, put into the church graveyard and set alight by the Victorians because they didn't think it was appropriate. So all that medieval stuff was completely lost, unfortunately. It's not, it's near, it's not those sort of um, religious changes that we're talking about. 
Um, and by the 1600s, you've got a new roof on it and, and, and all, the, all the wonderful other things. Um, and I just think that it would be so good that they didn't do these terrible things. And it's likely as well. It's likely as well, I think very much, that some, somewhat of the rude screen still survived in the church um, in, by the, about the 1850s, but I don't have any record of that being ripped out in the 1850s either. But I can presume that's the case. So um, I'd like to sort of, um, if we could have a you you've had that one image stuck on the screen for too long. So I'm going to um, move on a little bit more. But are we, we still seeing the same sort of one inside the black and white one, Del? Yes. Do you know, do you know I, 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 I really like this image. You know, it, it's, it's sort of really, really spooky. And I, I just think that, um, you know, these, these sort of eyes, you could sort of say here, um, the, arch architecturally, the, these could actually be seen as sort of load-bearing as well. Because when you, if you, if you, um, same thing you can say when you look at uh, Pont de Prive Wood, uh, Wood Bridge, Pont de Prive Wood Bridge. bridge. So when you look at the, I, I get, you got those big eyes in the bridge, yeah, those circles. Pont de Prive, you know the ones I'm talking yeah. about by the museum. They're actually yeah. to go bear, bear the bridge, um, and you usually get these when you get these circles. They sort of, they they offset the load within arches so this is what these are also being very decorative and dating that nice carved stone all the way to um the wonderful um medieval uh, period and just just quickly um what we what we would have it we would usually have a rude screen something like this um and there would be uh, it would sort of go down to about here um and you'd have a doorway here and you'd have a beautiful decorated rood on that side, very ornate door, doorway. And this doorway itself, um, you, it would be sort of trefoiled. You could sort of look into the chancel, but not actually take part. So hopefully we'll, we've got one of those images actually coming up soon. So that's where we're going to go. So here we go, moving on a bit, little bit further. So there we go, actually looking a little bit more down, down at the church um, and Langonive itself and there it is now that's not a rude screen actually in the church today that's actually that's actually one to be found in east anglia um uh, this is the one known as saint peter and saint paul rude screen uh, it doesn't have a gallery above it but this is the type of carving and the painting that we're talking about would have once existed at langonoid and the one at langonoid was a great one at langonoid so my notes tell me so I'm just going to sort of uh, pop onto my notes again, if I may. Um, and and it's, I've got a nice little bit of a story here that some of you may not have come across. It's called The Holy Rood of Lan Gunnoyth. And I, this is where we're going to go next. And I think we've got about 15 minutes left of the lecture. So I think I can get everything that I need to in. Um, I'm just gonna just gonna point through to see if I've got any uh, more images there. A minute of of the church. Um, no, that takes us to the corner in. So if I do this story now, oh, actually, uh, this is one thing I wanted to do. Right um, now, I'm having to, I'm moving you all around the screen. So if I put you up there, that makes things easier for me. Now. The, it's talking about the, the root um, screen of Langunoy, the original one that was, was ripped out. Um, and it's also associated with a pilgrimage route. Now, um, for those, um, those that don't know where um, Penn Reese is, that's where Penn Reese is. And that's where Langunoy did. Um, and that's where the, the monastery is. So if you, you could possibly put more or less a straight line and not too much out, but there's more or less a straight line, um, a pilgrimage route up and down into the valleys, up and down and all the rest of it. And this next little thing I want to read out, read out to you um, sort of sets that scene. So here we go. And so, so Penrice over here, Astrid, um, the Ronda Valley on this side where the where the arrow is, Langunoid, Meisteggers is marked, uh, Margam, 
the coast, Port Talbot, and let's carry on and read out what I want to read out to you. Here we go. This is, um, this is written by the um, fellow um, archaeologist, um, Madeline. Um, I haven't seen her for a while, but, but here we go. And the Holy Rood of uh, Langunoid. Langunoid is probably most famous now as the burial place of Anne Thomas, the maid of Kevin Idver, and a poet lover, Will Hopkin. And anyone who wants to look this up is Will with a single L. But in the Middle Ages, in the medieval period, it was famous as the shrine of the Holy Rood of Langunoid. Now think about this. Do you know what I need to do? Um, I need to get that image on. Let's just get that image on so you know where, but we, we know where we are with that plan. I've got to do this story um, with that. So um, having to constantly multitask you. So going back to that image, um, do, 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 do. there we go. Uh, and let's read. Thank you very much. Do, do, do. Hang on. And right. Right. So the Holy Rood of Lanaganoid, a carving of the crucifixion that was so vivid, it was believed to be able to perform miracles. People went there on, on pilgrimage. The poets wrote uh, about it in great praise. Lanaganoid was the religious place to be. I had no idea of that, but now I know. We can still trace many of the routes pilgrims would have taken to get to Langanoid. One route came over the hills. There you go, over the hills, from all the way from Penrith, and, and, and ran between Langanoid and the even more famous shrine of the Virgin Mary at Penrith. One route came to the coast at Langan, where the Cistercian monks had custody of the shrine. And one route came from the south, from the rich farmland of the Vale of Glamorgan. So you've got the, the likes of Monk Nash, you've got the likes of Marcos, which we've already mentioned. Um, and also um, Holy, um, Holy, Holy, Church at, um, Holy Cross Church at Cowbridge as well. So this was a route called the Fourth Givraith, the Road of the Law, because it was also the route that officials took traveling from the lowland to the wild hill country. So that links us back to the castle, the wild hill country, the Ford Igivraith. You can still trace these routes on the ground. And if you're very lucky and you've got somebody to guide you, you're able to find all these hollow lanes and all these hollow trails worn deep into the hillside by the many generations of travel travelers. Many people think of Christianity in Cymru, in Wales, from the Norman period. But Christianity has been in this land um, from the late Roman period. No, Christianity has been here long before those Normans take credit for Christianity in Cymru. It was here for six, seven hundred years before the Normans started changing things. And St. Kenoy is, is there within that beautiful rich landscape. And one thing I haven't been able to do tonight, tonight is, is actually um, what I wanted to do was actually to show you images of wayside crosses, which you can see occasionally dotted around um, the landscape of Mid Glamorgan and the Vale of Glamorgan. And what these wayside crosses basically are is um, um, little sort of little plinths, um, so sometime with a, with a stone cross erected into them, and obviously in the shape of a cross as well. We actually get these found a great deal in Cornwall. Lots of these, lots of these are still to be found in Cornwall, but not as many within our rich um, Christianized landscape. And anyone who's interested, going back to Ogmore at St. Bride's Major on Ogmore Down, between St. Bride's Major, going all the way to Pant uh, Mary Flanders that we did last week, there's actually a stone known as the Cross Antonii, and it's still there. It's a schedule inch monument. It's a, it's a stone carved base is really nice without the rest of the cross on it, it's really really nice and that route from St Bride's would have eventually ended up um, at Langanoy so everything seems to range onto Langanoy. Um, talking a little bit um, more as well that Langanoy like Merthyr Mawr, um, like um, Monk Nash um, was, was a landscape of known as a grange as well, it was a, a grange-like landscape so it would be those areas 
that would be farmed, um, which would be the produce, which would then be handed over to uh, Margam Abbey as a tide, and that would be transported around um, the landscape. And I don't know why I'm very much pro-Christian um, tonight, but I, it's, it's grabbed me. The importance of the, the Christian um, sanctuary that Langanoid once was. And if anyone wants to do any other research about another locality that seems to be, that seems to be missed out in, in the Christian trail, with early Christianity, is actually Koi Church, just outside Bridgend. Koi Church is a place to go to. Inside the church, there's some really nice carved stones. And the Langan and the Vale of Morgan, a really nice carved stone out there as well. We could go on with loads of different carved stones. Um, this is wearing me out, Del. Del, would you like to say anything to give me a breather a second? The horse finds fascinating. Um, yeah, the Fortigov Wright route still exists. It's um, a, a very narrow lane that goes up over the mountain from, I would say, you're looking Margaret. at you've got a map in front of you now, Del. Yeah, it goes up to Langanoid from sort of the Margan sort of area, um, or even Bridge End, you could say. Unfortunately, yeah. the M4 cuts it in half. As it does with lots of things. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you know what, folks? Right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I, you know, I, I know we started late today, um, but we'll, we'll just. We'll do another 10 minutes, say, if everybody's okay with that. But, but we, 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 we're not due to stop now because you haven't had your hour yet, but we will go over that. So the next one we're going to actually look at is the Corner House Inn. And the Corner House Inn is shown on the map that, that believe it or not, very small place where the Corner Inn is actually marked from Google there. Um, and that road itself... Um, is the road that we would take going all the way through. That's, that's leading into uh, my steg. Obviously, you've got Garth here. Um, and you, you're following sort of these valleys and sort of all the way up, all the way to sort of um, the wonderful site of Penrice. But, you know, there's so much that we don't know about the landscape. As me and Dell, if anyone's interested, use a plug. Um, if anyone at the end is interested in our archaeology and history on a Wednesday evening, have a chat with me afterwards. But anyway, um, I need to get on now. I need to look at the corner in. And there is the corner in. Um, it's believed to date beyond the 1700s. And Mary Lloyd, mm, I can't resist a bit of the Mary Lloyd, can I, Dell? You know, it's got to be chucked in there somewhere. No. Exactly. They must start places for it. Yeah, you know, it, it, it is the place for the Mary Lloyd. It, it lives there. So um, let's go on to my notes again. Hang on a minute. Hang on. Bit of a, bit of a problem with my feed a minute on this one. Hang on. Hang on. Da, 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 da. Right. So do you know what? We've got the Mary Lloyd in there. And I, I think it's probably time that I may mention a few ghost stories. Uh, uh, do I do the my steg one first? No, I'll do the my steg one, and then yeah, that 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 should be fine. Um, we've got a few images then. So the corner house. When you look at the when you look at the reading for this, it says that the corner house dates as as like a building for a pub or there 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 about from about 1722. They're quite precise on that. Um, was it a pub back then? Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. Maybe they sell beer. Um, but it's, it's seen that it had loads of different uses. I'm not actually fixing it down to anything. But if the building dates back to 1722, other people say it was the site, actually the building was actually the old tide burn. So if it was the old tithe band, being that it, it was the place that tithe went to, would mean that the corner house, the old corner house, um, is actually much older than 1722. It dates all the way back to the 1200s, at the time when the Normans were actually establishing, um, establishing a foothold within the landscape. The building, again, where, where our wonderful Mary Lloyd is, um, it is said to have been a school in the 1740s, and then we know, um, we know there it had a license in the 1840s, and and so on and so on. 
but let's go on to um, a little bit more about the Corner House Pub, Langanoid. Um, there you go, into history again. Um, Will Hopkins, touching history. The poet of the romance of Kevin Idver. Um, in those days, it said um, that whether it was an old tithe band, whether it, um, it, it, was, it was thought to be um, three cottages that were all sort of um, placed into one, sort of three sort of sets of bade cottages. Um, and we think about, um, we think about um, this wonderful corner house. Um, we think about the links with Will Hopkin and Anne Thomas. Um, but it's also said that people who actually take over the tenancy hear very strange things. And it's the first thing that they hear when they take over the tenancy of the Corner House pub. Um, it's also said another very strange thing. When, they, when the landlord locks the door uh, at night, it always seems to be unlocked by the morning. Um, and I don't know if that works with a chub lock, but apparently it's unlocked by the morning. So you probably need to barricade it. Um, the bar staff also feel that there's a presence there um, and that they can feel a voice. They, they can feel as if there's people there and they can hear voices in the bar. But it's obvious that they would hear voices in the bar when it's full, but not when it's empty which is the rather interesting thing inside the pub. So this is why it makes it rather spooky when you think about um, the, the Mary Lloyd being there. And it goes on to another little bit of story. A member of staff once saw a figure of man at the foot of the stairs in a white shirt. Um, and it's, it's said that, that this could actually be the ghost of a previous landlord. And when you think about these stories, particularly with really old pubs, with actual former uses, and, and you can actually sort of link this into the Plough and Harrow at Monk Nash when we, we talk about the things going uh, bumping in, in the night at Monk Nash. Um, another one, another strange thing about the pub as well, girls um, would complain of feeling a sense of unease when particularly cleaning glasses in the bar. Why is that? Um, and again, that's another interesting thing that links me with the pub, uh, the shoes at um, Mark Cross, where um, when, when ladies work there, they, there's, there's a presence of a, of a little girl that seems to occur and she seems to throw coins at you in the pub at Mark Cross. But again, it's that sort of unease where, where girls are actually in the pub and they, there's somebody there. A previous tenant um, of the pub had mentioned that his young granddaughter had seen a man in the bar when she had gone downstairs early one morning. Again, a young granddaughter seeing um, a gentleman in the bar. So I'm, I'm sure she would have been felt quite shocked. But then again, if she would have heard the fact that the, the door is unbolted by the ghosts, then she could have actually thought it was a real person. But then, given the description of the man, this matched the description of somebody that dated in all um, sense and purposes as somebody from the period of the British Civil War, sort of the fort, uh, sort of the 1640s, somewhere like that. I don't know if she described it right, but she said that this, this looked like a Cromwellian trooper. And, you know, it's, it's said that being a Cromwellian trooper, um, this, this might be something to do with pubs and um, houses being searched at the time of the Civil War um, for royalists that may have retreated in 1648 from St. Baggins. Another, another strange thing, which is, which is quite ironic, is the storehouse at the rear of the pub itself. Apparently, um, would be somewhere that would would seem very very cold even more cold than it should be um and it's, it's said that when wine is stored in the room um it will always keep cold even on the most 
um, warmest day. So this cold room would always remain cold, which is great. This is, you know, ghosts helping keep in a room cold. And it goes on, and there's, there's another little one as well. A waitress who, who had gone to, um, who had gone to, into one of the rooms inside the pub. Um, and as she leaned over to lift up a case, she noticed a figure was standing beside her. So can you, can you imagine um, how that would have felt? You sort of lean over to grab a case and then suddenly somebody beside you. Ah! So, so the, she said that the, the outline of the figure uh, was a hazy outline um, in the glare of a single light bulb. It sounds quite sort of um, um, Alfred Hitchcock, you know, in a single light bulb that's suddenly standing along, alongside me. She said that there was a sort of, um, there was a form of a, a form without a face. So it's like those types of figures that I've actually seen um, at places like uh, Mirtha Mauer. Um, and she hates, then hastily left, um, and she sort of would never return, um, not even with anybody else. She said, I'm never going in that room again. I'm not gonna do it. You know, it's very spooky. Um, and and this, this links me, this last little bit here is quite rather interesting that um, it's the appeasement of ghosts. Um, it's almost as if you, if you, if you accept, uh, can I, can I just actually go to my, my, my diary, which um, I've always meant to read this out, but I never had an opportunity to do this. I actually come across it today, actually. Um, and if you remember a ghost, um, they can't really harm you. It's almost as if um, you're, you're um, connecting with them. And it said that the staff accept the situation of hauntings in the pub and the storeroom and so on. And they say that um, Will is about, um, whenever something odd happens, and it's almost a, as if they're acknowledging the presence. And you know, I'd like to read this out to you. I, I've, I, I picked this up a, a little while ago. It's very short. Some ghosts can only be banished if you speak their name and their foul deeds spoken out aloud. So I'm not, you know, Will didn't do anything foul, but if you sort of, the first bit is interesting. Some ghosts can only be banished if you speak their name. And I think that's really interesting, that sense of acknowledgement. Where we've actually done over the past, um, you know, we've been doing these. This is the 10th one um, tonight. And we've, we've, um, we, we've, we've been doing these and we've been telling these stories. And, um, and it's great that we can, actually, um, we can actually come full circle and actually say that we've come across many cases like that. So I know if some of you want to go, please don't go yet. I want you to get to the end of this. Um, but I just want to, um, I just want to get to a, a final, a final thing about my steg. But before we do that, I want to actually just finish my images. So um, that that's that's our wonderful um, that's a wonderful uh, pub that we've just been looking at there. And and there's the Mary Lloyd and. You know, Langunoid. If if you if you think about any anything to do with Mary Trevilian, um, Mary Trevilian loves um, the Mary Lloyd, and I love the Mary Lloyd as well. And um, do you know what, folks? The two stories I was going to actually read from Mary Trevilian's book I haven't read. Dell, do you think it'd be a? Pre have we got a? Have we got enough time to do these two little stories out of the book, Dell? Yeah. Can you hear me, Dell? Yeah, I can hear you, but I've had to turn the sound off. Right, okay then. Um, we've still got a little bit of time to read out these two stories, yeah? I think so, yes. Right, okay then. Well, I'll just mention, um, I'll, I'll, you've all heard about the Mary Lloyd before, but I, I would say that um, Langunoy did one of the only locations um, in the 1800s that still had a visit from the Mary Lloyd. Um, being welcomed into the pub to um, add into uh, the jollities of the season um, around Christmas time and into the new year. And the tradition survived, and now lots of pubs and places um, in Cymru are welcoming Mary Lloyd, the tradition of the Mary Lloyd back. Um, and this itself is the old house in Langanoy, dating to 1147, the same date that we actually put um, onto 
um, the the castle that we find that the Normans put, first found in 1147. And what I'd like to do now is I'd like to do three things. Read out from my book. I'd like to mention something about my steg. So um, I've, I've met with my contract tonight. Um, Dufferin Farm, which uh, some of you are aware, are, are just outside my steg, um, was said to be troubled by a poltergeist that once threw stones. And a poltergeist that specifically bullied the youngest son of the household into doing its bidding. Um, and it's, it's sort of said that um, poltergeists can do that. They can sort of um, influence a child to do whatever they will. And which is quite unfortunate. There's sense a possession, really. But the poltergeist is directly telling the child to do these things. So encourage the poor, poor boy to let cattle loose and start fires in the haystacks, which would be, which would be quite sort of devastating. Obviously, it was eventually brought out of that, that practice. Um, and it was, it was brought out of that practice and the disturbances by the application of the black art. Um, and you may interpret that as you will. So what I'd like to do now, uh, I would like to uh, mention something directly about Clangunoid. I married Trevelyan. Langunoid was formerly um, um, known as the Old Parish. This title is said to have originated in the following way. Centuries ago, a young man of that parish died. It appears that a new apprentice of the village carpenter was very boastful of his scholarship. His master had always used Roman numerals. The youth, eager to give evidence of his talent, searched the alphabet and numbers generated used for a pauper's coffin. So th these numbers were to um, be in tribute to that young man who had just died. So this other young man is trying to put together um, the memorial. So he had some difficulty in satisfying the requirements for this individual that had died. Presently, he had found the correct initials, but not the number 28 representing the man's age. He struggled with numbers. So instead of putting down 28 as an inscription, he decided that he would nail four sevens on the coffin, which would render the age of the individual as 7,777. The inscription was not noticed until the coffin had been lowered into the grave. Then the clergyman's attention was arrested by the seven four, uh, by the four sevens, the four number sevens. He then asked the carpenter where where the deceased was born. And the answer was, in this parish, sir. And where has he been keeping himself all these ages? The young lad who had created the inscription of the, the four sevens did not understand the question. And when he said, in this parish, sir, the clergyman indeed remarked, therefore, this is an incredibly old parish, meaning, that Langanoid is the old parish, hence the title. And finally, folks, finally, this is to do with owls. So be very wary, any ladies watching this tonight. An owl will give away the fact that your, your path of chastity has not been kept. So here we go. When an owl was heard hooting early in the night from one of the ewes in the churchyard, it was looked upon as a sign that some unmarried girl of the village of Langanoid had forsaken the path of chastity. There are even now persons who maintain the trustworthiness of this sign. So in other words, if any of you shall be passing the graveyard at night and you shall hear an owl hooting, 
in the early night, I may add, then a girl has lost her chastity or her virginity in the village. And I think we'll leave that one there, Del. Del, have you got any questions? No, that was fascinating. Um, I, I have heard the four sevens story before. I think it's something that came up with you before. That was really good. But there is a thing locally about owls and one of the lanes has a sign on it, beware of owls. Do you know what, right? <laughs> beware of owls if you're a virgin, I think. <laughs> so, Dal, if you haven't got anything else to say, I'm going to bring everybody on. Thank you. Uh, and and um, we're going to we're going to stop we're going to stop the sharing. And here we go. Right, everyone stayed with us. Um, I I will announce that um, we will be doing another one next week. Um, and I think I'm going to leave next week as a surprise. I'm going to change. Um, the itinerary for next week because I've got an idea of something I want to do and it might be Mirtha Maur and then um, what I'm going to do I'm going to ask um, I'm going to unmute everybody Amy can you come in on this everybody mics on please yeah I'm here you know the following Saturday it's, uh, not next Saturday but the following Saturday it's your birthday isn't it uh, no July my, um, what's that my birthday next Oh, don't worry, we'll come to that. So as long as it's not next week. You know, I'm thinking, either next week is going to be a surprise, but if anyone wants to do Mirtha Mauer next week, that's the one that I might do. I'm going to change from the schedule. I might do Mirtha Mauer next week. I feel yeah. like I want to do it. Does that sound yeah. good, Del? It does. Let's go for it. Candlestone, Mirtha Mauer in there. Right, okay. Everyone has a say tonight. I would like... Um, um, I would like um, Kay Thomas to um, remain behind at the end, and Amy, anyone yeah. who join our Wednesday evenings, who isn't signed up for our Wednesday evenings, please let me know. I'm going to go through everybody and ask if there's any questions tonight. Um, Ellen, have you got anything to say? Keep it short. No, nothing at all. Okay, Sophie, have you got anything to say? Uh, nope. Well done. Um, Barbara and uh, Sue, anything? Keep it short. Very silent. <laughs> Have you enjoyed this tonight, you two? <laughs> Just had some lovely ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, okay, what, what, about, what about you, um, Karen? Any, anything you want to say? No, no, nothing. Okay. Um, John, keep it short. Anything you want to say? Yeah, you're still sending emails to BT. <laughs> I, 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 thought it, I thought it was B. I thought the BT one was the one you use. No. Oh, never mind. If you're still getting them to BT, how are you getting them anyway? Um, Elaine, is there anything you would like to say tonight? Right. No, stop it. I'll email you and put you in the picture. Good, John. Right, Elaine, have you got anything you'd like to say tonight? Yeah, and you probably uh, won't yes, read I it. Have. You get it. Go on, Elaine. Um, well, I was under the impression that the old house was the oldest uh, pub in in, uh, in the country, and that the um, Mary Lloyd on the on the sign for the old house says the Mary Lloyd is on the sign. Ma the, ma um, the 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 ma the Mary Lloyd um, the the Mary Lloyd was the own it would it was visiting households and all the pubs in Langanoid. And I know, because in the 1960s, in the 1960s, uh, um, the late 1960s, early 1970s, I was part of the Mary Lloyd. Can you stay behind at the end? I'd love to have a, a further chat about that one. Yes, you, you grabbed my imagination on that one. Um, and, I, was, I was in the corner, I, I was inside the corner house when the Mary Lloyd was coming in. Oh, wow. And, we sing, and singing, the, um, singing the songs. Oh, wicked, wicked. Um, and the church, go on. the church, I got married in the church. So, and you had, you, you, you went over the pub then and had a drink? Uh, actually, no, because, um, you know, your Four Sevens, yeah. there was a club called the Four yeah. Sevens, which yeah. was in Clanganoy. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where, I had, that's where I had my reception. Oh, yeah. well done. 
wicked. You, you know, it all comes together when you do something like that. That's really great. Um, and Kay Thomas, is there anything you would like to say? If you could stay behind at the end as well, Any, anything you'd like to say? No, it was, uh, it was very interesting. Um, it's um, too far east for me to be familiar with anything of it. Uh, I'm west of Swansea, so, but it was very interesting. Okay, <clears throat> so thank you very much. So stay behind Kay and Anne and anyone interested in the Welsh uh, thing. Uh, have you all enjoyed this tonight? Yes. 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 Oh, enjoyed yes. it. Thank, thank you very much. As, as I say, and also, um, Ellen, you stay behind. Uh, um, Ale um, Elaine, if you could stay behind as well. So Anne, Elaine, Kay Thomas, anyone else wants to stay behind to ask about the Welsh archaeology and history? Um, we've um, um, the ghost experience next week will be same time. Mirtha Mara will be doing next week, um, and we've also got our other online classes. And also, anyone who is interested, um, I've also got um, my book, um, which I which I've got behind me, which is um, 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 Ghost of Glamorgan. If anyone's interested, I have a word with me afterwards. Those that need to go, um, I'm going to say good night to everybody, and then those that stay do so. Thank you very much for joining us tonight, um, all 10 of you. It's been really great tonight. I really enjoyed this tonight. Thank you very much. But I'm going to say goodnight to everybody and those that stay, you know the drill. So, um, night night, Karen. See you. Um, night night. Night, everyone. Good night, all. And Barbara, Del, um, um, and also Sophie, um, also um, Ellen. Night night. Bye. Um, oh, good night. Good night. And so those that are staying, um, hopefully I've said good night to everybody that I need to say good night to. So, um, so who have we got left? So we should have Elaine and right. Okay, we've got the three of us now. Brilliant. So, okay, um, you know, um, the one thing I'd like to, um, Elaine, if only I knew that with you tonight, I, I'd just like to ask about. Um, I, you know, just one thing I wanted to ask, because um, I'm going to have to go in, uh, in about five minutes, but one thing I want to ask, Elaine, was when you saw the Mary Lloyd for the first thing, what did you feel? Um, well, I was a little bit on the drunk side, so, um, <laughs> but um, it, it, it's quite frightening when it comes to the door, because it, it, you know, it, it it's, uh, that horse's head is, is quite, you know, it's, Forceful. Yeah. But, um, I'm terrified but, of it. <laughs> but no, I wasn't, you know, I mean, I was in a group, so we were all there. And Mary yeah. Lloyd came um, and they were singing outside and then we were singing back to them. That's right. That's and, then right. They'd sing, and then they'd sing again and yeah. then we'd sing again. And, that you know, it went on like that for a little while. And then they came into the pub. The the punko the the the, the sailing exactly it's 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 so yeah. magical it really is. Um, so yeah. I wanted I wanted to ask um, Elaine, did you want to join us next week? Um, well, I won't join you next week. I wanted to hear about the ghost and uh, you know and what you knew about Langanoid because okay, no, there's no another problem. there's another go there's another ghost which I actually saw going down from going down from. Um, Langanoid at the top there, down to the lower Langanoid, which you you've got on your map as Pontry de Keefe, and that's where I actually lived. Oh right! In fact, my mother my mother still lives there. In fact, I was there this morning. Oh wow! And, and as you go down from, if you walk down from the church down towards the lower Lang, yeah, there's the a big land. there's a big field there. And when I was young, we went up to the church and then coming back down. And when we came back down. We saw a lady in white walking in the fields. Wow. But I, I, I don't know anything about it. And I wondered if you, you, knew, you were going to say something about that lady in white. Because I've never seen it since. I, I, t I tell you what, if, do you know anything else more about that? And let's see if we can look that up. You, that, is that all you've got about her? Or? Yeah, yeah. And nobody seemed to know. Well, lots of people had seen her before, but they didn't know. What connection? Carl, I've uh, heard about that story. I tell, I tell you what, Amy, that's your research for next week. Okay. So I, I'm going to, um, I'm going to, thanks for joining us, Elaine. Um, uh, well, I've, enjoy, I've, enjoy, I've enjoyed it. Very nice. Very good. No, very that's good. good. I'm really, I'm really pleased you have. And, and hopefully 
well, if you've got something else like this again, we'll, we'll, we'll see you again. Yeah. Okay, thank you ever so much. No, no, thank Elaine. You. No, no, Elaine. Bye. Bye. No, no. no, no. And I, wa I wanted to um, ask um, um, Kay Thomas there. Um, mm -hmm. Now, did you, did you come across this via Facebook? Yes, we had a conversation on Facebook. I'm the one who found, who'd, uh, researched a failed press ganging raid. And there was a Karen at the headland. Do you remember? Y yes. I yes, was they... writing a story about it. Ah, you're... and you sent me the text. Uh, I sent you a first draft prologue about how I was going to put it together. But the, the actual historical event uh, is in... I'm interested in the Gawa. Yeah. And particularly finding that cairn at the headland. Excellent, excellent. I tell you so what, if you were, did you want to join sorry. us next week? Well, uh, it, it depends. Are you? Uh, do, what area are you doing? Actually, we're we're actually doing Merthyr Mawr next week, and there's a few that will um, will be looking a little bit about wrecking. So that that might tie wrecking. in with what you're interested in. Okay. Um, so, yes, because you said come along and have a look to see what we do. Yes. And uh, and then decide if you want to commit, uh, yeah. which is why I've turned up tonight. Um, yeah. Uh, the wrecking and anything to do with smuggling and marine uh, activity and seafaring and stuff like that, that would be great. Yes. Um, but also my heart is if you could find that cairn on the headland and put a plaque there or something because uh, apparently no birds sing there and uh, even nature knows the eeriness of the murders. The so the to find is, it. The thing is we get exactly, I tell you what, right, come along next, right, no, come along next week. Um... Yeah, it, oh, okay, if you if you wanted to book next week, right, uh, you got the website details, yeah? Uh -huh. Yeah? Uh, yes, I have. What, what I'm going to do, I'm, next week I want to get into, I just want to get into the new inn, right? And I want to really get into it. So, um, so that, that's, that's what we're going to do next week. And what I'm hoping is that you might, you might feel a link with, your stuff and what I'm going to do next week. And we'll just leave it, we'll leave it on that one. Okay, and uh, you're going to kind of veer into wrecking and things like that, because I've got wreckers and, in the story as well. And lots of death. Okay, <laughs> and that's Wednesday. Uh, no, that, that's going to be Saturday, right? That's next Saturday, right? Oh. Wednesday, okay. Wednesday, is, is, it, Wednesday is, our, is, our, is our fresh start with our next eight. Uh, of our archaeology and history of Cymru, um, and if if you want if you wanted to pop on on um, if you wanted to pop in on Wednesday and see what we do on Wednesday, you'll be very welcome. And, and Wednesday Thank Wednesday will be more along, more along the lines of our history that we've made up and, and stuff. Okay. That, that you're, it's going to be a very bit of a mixed bag on Wednesday. Just come along. We'll bang you a link and, and you can see what you think. Okay. Thank you. Thank my you. pleasure. No, it's my pleasure. Thanks for, thanks for t um, taking the opportunity of joining us tonight. And I will, uh, so tell you what, join us on Wednesday and we go from there. Okay. Thank you very much. No, it's been, it's been my pleasure, pleasure. And thank you very much for joining us. Uh, you're welcome. Okay. Good night. Good night. Good night. No night. No night. No night. No night. Right, Amy. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to go myself. So, anything you want to say before I go? Um, no interest in. Um, I've been in the church. Um, been past the corner house. It gives me the heebie-jeebies every time. Um. I can't think of anything else. No, but it, yeah, I did know that Clan had a castle as well. Um. Good. And, and, and John nearly made a complete fool of himself again, but we just avoided it. I know. Sophie just messaged me saying, God is an angry git or a moany git. <laughs> uh, yeah, but we uh, he did manage to get him not to say much. You know, I just, what the, what the hell is, what, 
importance does it make whether whatever link we send him to where it's just irrelevant tosh oh, i don't yeah oh what about the surprise what's the surprise carl or is it for me as well what for mirtha mauer no the weekend after no because no um no that was going to be for next week hang on i've lost my blooming thing but um don't don't worry we'll just um we'll just go with the flow okay yeah we'll go with the flow anyway um i'm gonna have to dash okay no problem so i will i will see you next next week okay then yeah see you next week night night bye okay, bye, -bye. Yeah. Night, night 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 night